you're looking to buy your very first business using an SBA 7A loan, you're in for a treat. Watch me today as I sit down for a one hour loan interview with Bob Porter from Plumas Bank, one of the top community banks in the country doing SBA 7A loans. Today, I sit down and get answers to the top 20 questions buyers are asking me throughout the country. Let's get to it. Welcome to my channel. I am your host, Leo Landaverde, business broker and commercial lender, helping you buy and scale a profitable business. If you are a small business owner looking to diversify your wealth by buying a profitable business or a W-2 employee looking to leave the rat race behind by becoming the CEO of your own company by buying a profitable business, you are in the right place. Please subscribe to my channel. Don't forget to hit the bell. You'll be notified every Thursday when new videos come out. Hey everybody, well, welcome back to another one of our shows. I'm really delighted to be here today. And I got you guys are in for a treat because today I have Bob Porter from Plumas Bank in the house. Say hello to everybody there, Bob. Thanks for having me today, Leo. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. I am excited. Please, you know, that if the excitement doesn't come out of the screen, I mean, I mean, you'll you'll know why I'm excited about this. So to, to set things in perspective for those who are watching me all over the country, I'm going to give you a little context, a little bio. I think it would help to know for you guys to know who Bob Porter is. So I'm going to read from his uh, bio. Bob Porter began his career as an SBA lending in SBA lending since, in 1989. After graduating from the University of California State University in Sacramento with a degree in finance. For the past 34 years, Bob has acted as vice president and business development officer for four banks, including uh, Sacramento Commercial Bank, Bank of the West, Comerica, and most recently for the past 15 years, Plumas Bank. Uh, and during this period, has successfully negotiated and funded. Are you ready for this? approximately $434 million worth of SBA, 7A, 504, and non-SBA commercial real estate loans. Without further ado, there is Bob Porter. You Thank ready you for this? Well. All right. So here's what we got for you guys today. Um, I, we have, I have about 24 questions from you guys who are subscribed to my channel, there have either been comments, emails that I received, uh, messages and or comments on Instagram or Facebook. And I have basically curated this list and put it down into these topics. There are the buy, buyer topics and there are the target business topics. I will do my best to cover in the time that we have. We probably not want to exceed um, about an hour. And if, we, if we, there's stuff that we don't talk about, I may just have to have Bob come back. And I hope you guys are okay with that. So without further ado, I want to start off, lead us off with the, one of the questions that I get a lot is, what about industry experience? Um, do the, does the buyer need to have like for like industry experience? And please, you know, tell us what you think. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's really a common sense issue here. Can you run the business you intend to buy or in some instances start? That's really what it boils down to. It's a common sense. Can you argue to me and my underwriter that you have the ability transferable wise? For example, if you are going to buy a full service sit down restaurant, you better know what front of the house means, back of the house means, et cetera. You better have not just eaten in a restaurant, but worked in a full service restaurant, sit down. If on the other hand, you want to buy a simple franchise, whether it's a Subway sandwich, a Togo's, or something more basic, that's a little bit more homogenous, a little simpler to run, and you've got the franchise training, no, we're good with the franchise training in that instance. Okay. But industry... Industry experience is very critical in certain industries. If you want to buy a general contracting business, you better know how to run that business as a general contractor in the trades, whether it's HVAC, plumbing, heating, you know, plumbing and heating, electrical, etc. If you want to be a bridge builder, you better have built bridges, right? 
Good, good point. And you know what? This this happens, and I think a lot of people get misinformed when they're doing their research. For instance, we know that the trades are can be very, very profitable, right? The the, the HVAC, the, the the you know the, the plumbing, the electrical, and they have their licensing requirements, which is a different question that I'll ask in a little bit. But I'm just throwing some things at the wall right now. So sure. let's say you have somebody who has 20 years worth of management experience. Uh, maybe not necessarily an HVAC, but has run, built PLs, managed 40 people, has a lot of the management experience in PL jurisdiction, and knows some of the trades, but not necessarily in that maybe in that industry. Could someone like that make a case for like, hey, I may not have run a five million dollar HVAC business, but I have run a $20 million manufacturing, for instance. Is is can that can a case be made? Absolutely. The case can be made. The downside, the trade-off is the licensing. And we have to, that's another conversation that we have to deal with. But yeah, the, the, the case can be made because you're probably dealing with a very financially uh, deep borrower. They have the mm-hmm. depth, depth and breadth financially. They've saved, they've saved both cash, they've saved in retirement, they have personal assets, they own a home, they may own some rentals, they have exceptional credit, and they hierarchically have a deep resume that has done many, many more things. I'll use another example. If you are a mechanic, you are not always the best buyer for an auto repair facility. Whereas you and I might be a better buyer for an auto repair facility where we're hiring mechanics, we're hiring right. ASC certified, but that mechanic may not be business as business inclined, not to say he's not or she's not, but they might not be as business inclined as a business person coming out of corporate America who is going to oversee and work on the business, not in the business. Very, very good question. So that, you know, that is the difference between this, the operator and the builder, right? Um, Absolutely. A builder is going to buy a, a larger business, probably a multiples of adjusted EBITDA, who is going to want to have an, a, 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 a responsible management person in place. And that's a different mentality than somebody who wants to get their hands dirty and change oil, right? A, a Absolutely. Kind of uh, good, really good point. So, you talked about it a little bit, and I think it's just very repeating. The, the businesses that in the state of where whatever state you are, uh, we're in California, and the licensing requirements. Now, that is it comes up as an issue, right? So if you have somebody with has a great background, but not the license, how do you guys go about bridging the gap? You know, the, the, the whole concept of responsible management officers. So you want to talk about yeah. that? So the RME or responsible responsible managing employee for California in particular, and every state's a little bit different. We're pretty conservative contractors license wise. We historically have dealt with it where we've allowed certain buyers to buy a business as long as there was at least 10% seller financing in the deal. So a buyer might put 10, 20, 10, 15, 20% down. A seller might carry 10% or more. Mm -hmm. We have a financial hook in the seller to stick around to act as the RME or responsible managing employee for a period of time until, yes, that's the hook, right? You need a financial hook in the seller to play nice, right? To stick around because the buyer is operating under the seller's license for a period of time. Now, here's the problem. It might take... It might take up to four years to get that license for an inexperienced buyer. So we're going to vet that process. Our goal is that it takes two years or less. But historically, SBA has said a seller cannot stay involved in a business for more than a year. Now, coincidentally, right now, SBA has changed their standard operating procedure, their SOPs. And that SOP has changed to the tune where a buyer can buy, let's say, 90% of a business, 95%. 80, 85, whatever, not 100 any longer. This is just new, literally a week new. Right. And that may allow the seller to stay on for that period of time under ownership. And the licensing is not an issue at that point because the seller is carrying the license. The seller is still 
part and parcel to the business ownership. in an ownership role. And then you have this whole thing about the guarantees, right? So long as there is a less than 20% ownership. So with the seller that it stays on with the seller carry, and if it is 10%, do they still have to personally guarantee on the loan? Yeah. So this is an open question right now that I do not have an answer for. And, and that's here okay. is why. Yeah. Here is why. Historically, if a if you and I are buying a business, I'm 90%, you're 10%. You are not a guarantee, a guarantor on that loan. I I am the sole guarantor on that loan because you own less than 20%. Right. However, if you are the contractor's license holder and we are buying an HVAC company, you are a key employee. Oh. And you may then, that may then trigger your need for guaranteeing the loan because that of the key sense. role. Okay. So that's really key. You can't have somebody who doesn't know what they're doing going in to take it over and you being a shell buyer and being skirted from having to guarantee the loan, even though you're an important role in that transaction because you're the license holder. This so is really good stuff. A, I don't have a definitive answer yet, except to say um, we're, we're using common sense right now. We're going to test them over the next month or three as we see right. those deals come in. Yep. And, that goes and we're going to pointedly, right. and we're going to pointedly go to SBA with a, with a scenario and say, this is the transaction we're working on. Here's the ownership structure. Here's the finances. Here's the money. Here's the brains. Here's the brawn, whatever the roles are. What do you want us to do? That's what we're going to ask SBA. Do I need right. Leo's? Do I need the license holder Leo's uh, guarantee? He's only ten percent. Right. Bob's buying ninety percent of his business, or Bob and Leo are buying the business together, but he's the license holder, for example. So we don't know what that looks like yet. Awesome. So let's let's transition now to location. Is another topic that comes up uh, quite a bit. How far is too far? How close is too close? Right. If you got. If somebody lives in a small town, and I know you said that there is a there is a jurisdiction in which you know you service X amount of states, I'll let you talk about that when when we. But let's say, is it if we are in California? I'm in the Central Valley. Bakersfield is 200 mile, 100 miles south. Modesto is 100 miles north. To give the, the, our, our subscribers a, a, a reference, what from the bank's perspective, what makes what is your take on the geography? Um, I go I go back to common sense. Can you run that business from afar? What is the nature of that business? What involvement is the seller playing now? What role? What okay. role will you play? And what's your long-term plan? I have a transaction right now in Bakersfield, borrowers okay. in Fresno. Mm. Borrower. <laughs> How about that? Borrower, that's a that's a bit of distance. Borrower yeah. wants to move to Fresno. Okay. okay. Well, what did I say? If the deal's in Bakersfield, right? Bakersfield. So the, the buyer's borrower, in Fresno, but they would have to move to Bakersfield or wanting to move to correct. Bakersfield. Correct. Okay. It's the other way around. Buyer's in Bakersfield, wants to move to Fresno, buying a business in Fresno. But he will not move for two or three years. Okay. So what we've done in this case is, what involvement does a seller play? What involvement will he play? What business does he have now in his town? What's his long-term transition? And we have factored in a small housing stipend for his visits. So oh. he's he's not going to drive back and forth every day, but he may come up two days a week. So right. we factored in about 10. Mm -hmm. As an offset to renting. We've said he's going to travel. He's going to stay in a motel or hotel, Airbnb, et cetera. What's it going to cost? And so we factored in a little bit of money for it. And that's and how guys, we dealt with that. This is a really good, uh, I'm glad that you brought that a specific example, Bob, because I want you guys to think through as a buyer watching my videos. It is really a circumstantial case for the best case scenario. How can you present yourself as a buyer? Something that is plausible, that makes sense. Common sense is what we're coming up here with, with what we're talking about. But 
how will the lender feel comfortable with the game plan, right? Uh, the ultimate game plan. Can you, you know, and, 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 and the reality is that the lender wants to make loans. It really is up to the buyer to make a case that makes sense. It can be pie in the sky situation. You have to understand, I am going to go from employee to employer. I'm going to be responsible for a 20, 30 person for FTE payroll. And how am I going to ensure that this business is going to be successful? You fill in the blanks, right? As a buyer. So Absolutely. Awesome. So let's get that's question number two of 24. And we just we may have to have you back, man, but this is really good. I I you're bringing so much actionable knowledge already to our buyers. I guarantee you, you're gonna get you're gonna get some feedback. All right, let's go on to the next. Uh net worth. Well, I know that there is some misinformation out there that if you don't have real estate, you cannot you know, because the the whole collateral situation. How does you, in your experience, what have you seen in terms of, you know, SBA being a cash flow lender and then with there is collateral picking it up and somebody doesn't own property? How do you work that in? Um, the buyer's net worth needs to be commensurate with the deal. Okay. If you're fresh out of school, don't have a lot of money to work with, don't go chasing a $5 million business. Right. Okay. It needs to be commensurate with your financial depth and breadth. You need to have ample down payment investment wise, enough skin in the game that we're comfortable with the transaction, enough additional working capital available to run the business after you take over. And it can't be pie in the sky. Nobody's going to do 100% financing. Nobody's going to finance a $5 what? million dollar transaction. No, no, with zero somebody percent who down. has. Yeah, nobody's going to finance a, a $5 million transaction for somebody who has $100,000 to their name, doesn't own real estate, doesn't have any retirement assets, and has a bunch of debt. It just doesn't make sense. So buy at your level. Buy at your level. Okay. Chase something Wait. that is within your reason. Don't pie in the sky. This is great because it takes... Let, let, let's play a scenario here. What about somebody who is a business owner with say a service business with a strong balance sheet, you know, and then we get into the strong current ratio, debt to equity ratio, great profit margins, solid year over year performance. And then it, it may want somebody to diversify maybe one or two degrees away from that they currently do to just build some wealth, right? They have the management experience in the payroll to prove that they have the management experience. Um, and this comes up a lot. Say you have a situation in which, hey, you know what? I am getting older. I own a engineering firm, solid, profitable, throwing, you know, great cash, you know, in the excess of 300,000 now. And they want to get into an asset class, say like self-storage, right? You know, okay. that, that, okay, list. So self-storage, it, you know, well, you're running an engineering firm and there's, a, okay, let's talk about what would happen in a case like that. And somebody, let's say, does have the $200,000 for a 10% commitment on the equity side. And then and how do you look at this? I know what, you know, the global debt service coverage ratio management experience versus the cash flow coming from the deal. I want to hear your, your take on that. So we love that borrower's professionalism, education, mm -hmm. presuming their credit's good. I'm sure it is. We love, plus. Let's, yeah. we love outside recurring income to, that supports the household's need to live financially. Mm -hmm. Business that they're buying stands on its own. It cash flows nicely. We still want them to put a down payment into the transaction to have a skin in the game on that new deal. Sure. And depending on that deal, it's going to range 10 or more percent uh, down payment. As far as collateral is concerned on that self-storage facility, we're going to take a deed of trust in the property yeah. for what it's worth in that industry, a general lien on business assets, which there really aren't any. Uh, right. Maybe some office equipment, tables, chairs, et cetera. It's, and an, if it's, they a, own it's a real home, estate play. It's a real estate play. Yep. Right. And if they own a home, we're going to cross collateralize with their home in many instances. It depends on the loan we put them in in that case. It could be an SBA 7A loan where we have to cross collateralize when there's equity available in other real estate. But on the 504 loan, we don't always have to cross collateralize. It's rare that we do, actually. Well, and so no, that was just, yeah. And so and that's that a different threatened. loan that is less applicable to business acquisition only, 
it's more applicable to real estate transactions. Which is going to happen. So, um, and you know, everybody, so, and let's get, and I'm not even sure if this is, this is even, but this is, let me tell you something, this is something that's top of mind for a lot of my viewers is, okay, Leo, I I'm a, I want to be out of that rat race a little bit at a time. I, I don't want to go and buy a $3 million. I have the down payment, the 725 score. I have the $2 million net worth. I just don't want to buy HVAC. I don't want to buy, but I do want to get into something like a car wash or a uh, coin operated laundry or uh, something that doesn't need me to be there 40 plus hours a week. How do you evaluate those buyers? Or how, what, what are the situations in those? We love them in a sense that they're keeping their job. They have yeah. that outside recurring income that I've mentioned. Yeah. So they're, they are, if you're quitting your job and you are solely 100% reliant on the income associated with a business, one, it's got to feed your family. Two, it's got to pay us back. And there needs to be a little buffer above and beyond that. Okay. In the instance where you're buying something and keeping your job, we love it because there is recurring income. It is semi-passive income self-storage, uh, coin-op laundry, et cetera, uh, some car washes. And it's a fabulous play, just as I would liken that to a spouse or an investor who has rental properties. They have outside recurring income. So you might buy a business, leave your job, no income longer. But if you're married and your spouse has an income, it's fabulous. It's a huge help to offset you know, somebody who's solely buying a business and they're 100% reliant on the business's income to survive, obviously is a little bit riskier than if there's outside income to the household, yeah, no matter I mean, what it is. Yeah. And you know, it, it's all common sense. You know, I help buyers analyze, you know, I, I have a lot of the same tools and I have developed my own tools. You see some of the tools that I have and it's, I'm, when I, people ask me, Leo, when I'm looking at a deal, how do you know it's going to feed my family and it's going to pass the sniff test by the SBA lender, right? And really what I, when I'm looking at a deal is, is it priced appropriately for debt service coverage? Meaning, do you, if you pay in excess of three or four times SDE or adjusted EBITDA, and it's not going to give us a healthy meat on the bones, one, two, three, 1 1.5 or more debt service coverage ratio with nice cash flow flowing down the line to feed your family. It may not be a deal you want to look at, right? If Absolutely. It is too, if it is too thin, a barely 1.2 debt service coverage ratio, why will you leave your corporate job? It, it's, it's just going to make you feel a little antsy, right? Absolutely. I'll go a little further. If And I see it all the time. I'll see somebody who needs to make $100,000, $150,000 a year to live on. And they come to me and there's a business making eighty dollars or hundred. dollars Well, first off, you're accustomed to making one hundred dollars to one hundred and fifty. dollars Now you're going to make a business, you're, you're going to buy a business that makes eighty, dollars but that isn't the debt service yet. That's Correct. just what it makes on an adjusted cash flow basis. So how are you going to feed your family as you have historically and pay us back for whatever debt load it may have on it? It needs to be, again, common sense, commensurate with your needs overall on a global basis. What do you need to make to live? Can you pay us back? Bob, this is gold. All right. There's so many golden nuggets here that we're going to turn into like probably 20 reels in, in YouTube. I mean, this is gold. Forgive me if I get excited. This is this is what I love. But you guys hear from me every, you know, I talk about deals, but to hear from an actual bonafide lender with 35 years of experience, this is gold, Bob. And I cannot thank you enough for this. So You're let's welcome. let's 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 move on a little bit. Let's cross over to the to the to the bright side with the cash is, which is the target business. Okay. All right, so businesses with rapid growth, right? So it, it, it may be a good problem to have, but it can work the other way around with the working capital. So let's say you have a business that has been hockey stick growing, you know, 1 million, 2 million, 4 million, 7 million, and, and the seller wants to, you know, capture, exit just when you think it's going to go up. When you, how do you evaluate a deal that is, you know, on paper, on an accrual basis, making really good money? They're not skimping on the taxation side. They're reporting all their income. What comes to mind when you're looking at deals that have rapid growth? My simple answer is this buyer is not my typical leveraged SBA buyer. They are stronger. 
They are stronger okay. financially. Absolutely. Okay. okay. They own a home. Okay. They have equity in the home. They might get a, lo- a line of credit on that home ahead of my third deed of trust on that home for collateral to use that half a million dollar line of credit to run that business post-closing. Or we might do an accompanying SBA Express line of credit. So we finance the business only with an SBA 7A loan to buy the, buy the business, mm-hmm. but we may do an adjunct um, SBA Express line of credit for, I don't know, 100,000 to 500,000 to run for that working, business. For working capital. Exactly. I In the last three years, I financed two large uh, nursery, plant nursery operations. Okay. Plant nurseries just went crazy, boom, during COVID. People weren't going to work and weren't doing some other things, weren't going to Hawaii on vacation, et cetera. So they started gardening. They started planting. And those businesses went ballistic. But they have a seasonal need, one, and they were growing gangbusters. So they have a need for a line of credit because of their seasonality, their grow season, their off season. Right now, everybody's buying plants, and putting them in the ground, it being right. May. Um, hmm. But in January, nobody's buying plants and putting them in the ground. A few people are, landscape people are, but you and I as homeowners are not. And so you may need a line of credit to get through the winter. And so that buyer who is buying a business with substantial growth, which was your primary question, needs some deeper financial pockets to support that growth. Okay. I just came back from the International Business Association in the IBBA uh, conference in Orlando. You know, that was, the, the, you know, the concept, this, I went to a session talking about working capital exclusively, what to do about working capital, how to properly uh, factor it in, what about excess working capital and burn rates. So as um, I know it's probably not here. I'm sorry, I'm just excited because I, you know, working capital is something I think about all the time. How do you, do you factor when you're doing your spreads, like uh, at which point do you start to think, okay, where's the working capital coming from? Is the seller going to leave it behind, right? Is it going to be, is it going to be, if it is a stock transaction, an equity transaction, is it going to be enough cash in AR, much healthier than AP to make our working capital for the first 60 days or so? If not, is the buyer having, bring in the working capital or is the bank? So talk to me about, you know, what, how do you decide which way to go? So it's, it's a general rule of thumb that banks don't love to lend working capital. And the reason we don't, and the reason we don't is very simple. We are leveraging a buyer into a transaction anyway. Let's call it 85, maybe 90% financing. If a buyer is buying a million dollar business and putting a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand $150,000 down, and request 300 in working capital, net net, they don't really have any skin in the game because we've lent them back 100 to 300,000 in working capital. Right. So yeah, they have deal, they have money in the deal, but it's almost a farce in that it's we've lent them back a bunch of working capital to offset that. It's not our preference to include working capital whenever possible. But I will tell you, a business that carries substantial accounts receivable is by default a huge indicator of a business that needs working capital to float those receivables. It's my preference, um, and it should be yours and the sellers and the buyers, that the buyer purchases a large amount, if not all of those receivables from the seller, whether it's an asset purchase transaction where Mm -hmm. ARs are typically not included and cash is not included, you're not buying the balance sheet, or it's a stock purchase where you are buying, let's call it a Polaroid of the situation, a, a moment right. in time. The stock trying to figure out how to buy a business, how to connect the dots, what comes first, what comes later. If you want to know more, schedule a time to chat with me. I'm scheduling free complimentary calls and kind of help you along with your journey of buying your first business. All you have to do is drop me a comment below or email me directly. My email address is in the description section of this video. Come on, let's get to it. Buying, you know, let's, most transactions are asset purchases, fewer stock purchases. 
one benefits the seller more than the buyer and vice versa. On an asset purchase, there's no reason a seller, a buyer can't purchase 100, 200, 300,000 in ARs. So if at any one time, a normal AR um, accounts receivable balance for a seller is, let's just say on average, $300,000, there's no reason that the buyer can't finance or purchase 250 of it and finance 85 or 90 percent of that 250 in addition to the purchase price. Then they have the built-in working capital there anyway. I argue this. A lot of sellers say, I don't want to sell ARs. Well, who's going to collect those ARs for you? Well, the buyer is. They're, the customers are not going to send them to the seller's home after close of escrow. They're going to send them to the business anyway, right? right? If they're right. sending checks, for example, they're right. going to send them to the business. So the buyer is getting all this money and saying, boy, I wish I had this money for working capital purposes. But no, once a week, they've got to package those checks up, deposit them, send that money to the seller. That's silly. Finance right. 85 or 90% of that over a 10 year loan term, you're leveraging into that, into your working capital as well. There's absolutely no reason to do that. The difference in timing of getting paid, the seller's gonna wait 30, 60, 90 days. The buyer can amortize those over 10 years and have built in working capital in the deal. And then we don't have to fund it either. And the buyer doesn't have to have it. They just have to have the 10 or 15% to buy those additional ARs. I think that's money, guys. That That's gold again. And you know what? I think this there comes a time. Right now, I, I want, you know, if you're, if you're watching this video, if you just came into the last 10 minutes, well, we have Bob Porter from Prumas Bank. Um, you may not know. You, you have to go back to the intro to find out more about him. Why don't you take a couple of minutes right now, Bob, and tell us why would a... a, a this is when you do your pitch. Why Plumas Bank? How can you take care of our buyers? Sure, I appreciate it. So I I work for a small community bank. I've largely always worked for a small community bank. And what I like about it over the big banks is it's much more intimate. You know, I have a small group of 11 here, a few underwriters, a few processors, some servicing side, and some other business development officers like myself. I can literally call, well, the credit, our our Credit decision people are both in my office and the president of the bank is a phone call away. It's not this hierarchy of management. It's a very quick decision. So in all fairness, whether whether a buyer chooses me as their lender and a small community bank or a big bank, pardon me, let me rephrase that. Whether they choose me personally to work with, I would urge them to to choose a small intimate relationship that they can have all over those decisions okay that's probably the best for me it's always worked as an employer to work for a small community just because of the small intimacy i have so much more control over that i don't have to go to corporate in new york or other other states it's all here it's all centralized um, the other plug that I'll give myself for what it's worth is I'm not only a lender of 34 years since I graduated college, I was also a borrower. I built one of the largest with a partner. I built one of the largest rock climbing gymnasiums in the country in Rancho Cordova, California. It's called Granite Arch Climbing Center. I, I've since sold that, but for nine years, I owned that. And not only did I get an SBA loan to do a startup of that, Six banks declined my loan before the seventh bank approved my loan. Really? I subsequently went, yeah, I subsequently went to work for that bank because their aggressiveness and common sense. Our business was successful. We exited fine, um, paid back the loan, but six banks said no, shamefully, and the seventh mm. approved it. So it tells you a couple of things. One is I'm not only a lender, but I sat on the borrower side. And two is don't ever stop chasing your dream. That's wonderful. And you know what? Uh, for those of you watching, in the description section of this video, we're going to have the link so you can get to Bob directly. You don't have to come through me. And if you if you don't find that information, just send me a comment. Hey, I want to talk to Bob. I'll connect you with Bob. I want you to talk to them. And speaking of which, and thank you, there is a geography uh, scope that you have. And I want to tell what, what states do you service? 
you yeah, know, so the US. we are not a we are not a national lender, which is one of the disadvantages of a, of a small community bank. We want to lend in states that we know well enough. We can travel to very quickly if necessary, do site visits, meet with clients, really know the demographics of. So we lend in California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. Only those seven western states. Yeah. Well, that's that's good to know. I mean, if you have a deal uh, in those seven states, by all means, I would want you to reach out to Bob. Um, okay, I'm going to throw one. May or may not be here. Sometimes, you know, buyers are representing themselves. They're not working with a buy side broker. They want to take on the other side and want to... The, the seller may may or may not be represented by a, a broker, a listing broker. Say that you have a buyer who wants to put their best foot forward. They got their resume. They got the, they know what to say. They have some industry experience, whatever industry vertical they want to go into, but they're lacking uh, some type of endorsement from an SBA lender. Will you be open to the idea of saying, hey, uh, although you know you cannot fully pre-qualify a buyer. If you if you were to talk to a buyer and say it's kind of a letter of support, would you be willing to do that? Uh, and 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 to to a qualified buyer based on you know what you know what to ask. I do, and I do it every day of the week. Um, it's a lot of work. I know. I mostly, I mostly pre-qualify listings for business brokers and listings for sellers directly. Um, although the latter is not that common, but working with brokers like you, I'm pre-qualifying a lot of listings. Yep. But about one of 10 that I do is the pre-qualification of a buyer. Honestly, 70 to 80% of our decision is based on what a buyer is purchasing. It's cash flow and it's price commensurate with its cash flow. Does the deal make sense? The pre-qualification of a buyer, I have to be honest, is not always worth the paper it's written on. And the simple task is this. If 80, 70 to 80% of our business or our decision is based on the business you're buying, only 20, 30% or so is based on the buyer. The reality is, do you have the money to do the deal? Mm -hmm. Do you have the experience? Do you have any collateral? If it's even applicable. Yeah. Does the deal make sense? And how is your credit? You can't come to us with poor credit. You have to come with enough money to do the deal and excess liquidity to run the business post-closing. And you have to have the financial depth and breadth commensurate with that deal. Again, I go back to the $5 million deal. If you have $100,000 to your name, you're not buying a $5 million business. That's right. You're buying a $200,000, $300,000 business. That's the reality. Yeah. And, and, that's, and so, that's yes, awesome. I pre-qualify buyers really to let them know, almost to give them a comfort level that, yeah, I've looked at your, I've looked at your resume. I've looked at your credit. I've looked at your cash. It, this seems to fit. Go chase a business, but don't chase, don't chase a business. that's too large. Really, and it's the qualifying yeah. of businesses more so. And it's the coaching too. I mean, you know, and I get it. I don't want to, you know, you, and you, you and I both know the statistics that only about 10% of buyers buy, you know, a lot of them are tire kicking. You know, a lot of you guys are looking at businesses, biz buy, sell. This is my frustration, right? Buyer comes to me and says, hey, you know, I'd be looking at all this business. And you ask a series of very simple questions. And um, I am, my FICO is 640. I'm making about 60,000 a year. I got a little bit of debt. No, I don't own a home. And then you start thinking where is the where is the meat on the bones where is the management experience where's the wherewithal right um and okay so and the you know there's a lot of questions and we and we're actually 20 minutes away from finishing anything you want to talk about from this uh, that that you wouldn't want to talk about from these questions just let me know and I and I'll ask you that what do you think would be exciting to talk about to our buyers right now that they haven't heard from me yet <laughs> um Who's the best buyer for a business? All right. Who's the best buyer for a business? The best buyer for a business, although unfortunately, generally, I'm generalizing and I'm hoping not to offend too many people. The best right. buyer for a business is the existing manager of that business or a key employee of that business. It's been there for three to 10 years. Okay. 
The biggest problem I face with most businesses is that buyer doesn't have any money. Mm, they have not they, planned ahead. They are right. not entrepreneurial enough, or they haven't made enough money over the years to plant that seed. If you are thinking you want to and you're working in an industry you love, the best business you can buy, because you can probably get the best deal on it, is the business you work for now. If they plan to sell in the next three to 10 years, you plant the seed with the seller, you start saving the money, you get the necessary coaching, you prove yourself, you make that business better. Now there's a catch 22. If you make the business too good, then you're buying all the value you created in it, right? Right. So if you make them an extra dollar and it's a three multiple, you got to pay extra $3 for the business. Yes, <laughs> for every dollar on net profit, yeah. But at the same time, you know, it's part of the learning curve for it. But if right. you're if you're out looking to buy a business, um, I'll, I'll give a few things. Is One is save every penny. Don't buy some fancy new car. Don't take out new credit cards. Mm. Pay off those credit cards. Bankers hate credit cards. We treat them in the worst way possible. Don't rent a six, you know, we're in California, so don't rent a five, six, seven thousand dollar a month house. Live a little further away, drive mm. a little further, and mm. pay a little less in rent. We tax that. You know, everybody needs to make a certain amount of money to live on. Okay. And we calculate using what we call a 45% debt to income ratio. 45%. This calculation works for most people. We all have to make a certain amount of money. Well, that money that we have to make to live is based on our lifestyle. So if you have a mortgage or rent payment of $2,000 a month, you've got a car payment of $1,000 a month, you've got $10,000 in credit card debt, we take all that, all that data and we extrapolate what you need to make to live using the 45% debt to income ratio. The less that number is, the more... Of a one, the more of a business you can buy, the great, the larger business. Two is the more apt that we're we're going to finance that business because the debt service coverage ratio is stronger. It's not weak because you buyer needs to make more money. The less you need to make to live, according to our calculation, the better it is for you to get financed. Again, and I go back to where we started when you have outside income. That net draw need for a buyer, for instance, if you need to make $100,000 a year to live and your spouse makes 60, you only need a net 40. There's a whole lot of businesses you can buy out there for 40 or more. On the other hand, yeah. on the other hand, if you need to make 150 a year to live and there is no outside income, You've got to buy a pretty large business to support your personal needs. Mm. You know, incidentally, um, what industries today, you know, in May 2023, whatever you watch this video, this we're recording on May 25th, 2023. Um, what industries are you seeing a lot of deals in right now? What industries? Come. Anything construction related. Really? So you're Anything seeing deals in construction. I think what, here's my theory. In the Great Recession, the industry got destroyed. Okay. Yeah. And basically, and it bottomed in 2011, 2012. All of those people did not get to retire. And they wanted to, many of them wanted to retire. They literally had to wait for the last 10 years to retire. And so they're retiring a little later than they wanted to, baby boomers. And we're at a peak or, you know, in theory, last year we peaked about this time. About 11 months ago, we peaked as far as the construction related industry for most construction related in California, I'll say. And so the HVAC, the plumbing, the electrical and other specialty, granite, uh, cabinetry, et cetera. Roofing. I'm seeing a lot of those deals right now. Some Anything of them pencil, yeah. some of them pencil, some of them do not. What I'm finding in general is that most of them are overpriced in their listings because a seller, every seller thinks that their business is worth a million dollars. Okay. And not every business is worth a million dollars. Some of them are worth 600,000. 
And the reality check just needs to come in, which is where you play a role as a broker Correct. to give reality Correct. check to a seller. Hey, your business is not worth a million dollars. If you want to sell it for a million, you need to bring it up to a million. But it's not. It's, right. And this is what I say to every seller when I said, look, based on the analysis on the spread of your financials, can the business afford itself? I want you to put yourself in the, in the, in the shoes of a buyer. If you were to take your seller hat off and put a buyer hat off, could you afford that business based on the cash flow generated evidence by tax returns, right? That does it make sense? Is it making the money to support itself with a 10% down payment to a qualified buyer? Is that a good question to ask? That's a, that's a perfect question to ask. The common sense of it. Would you seller buy this business for this price? Right. And I guarantee you 90% of them would say no. No, I'm not going to pay that much. Well, why do you why do you think you deserve that much? So that's exactly. the reality check. Um, um, the other industry that I see a lot of right now, and I also work a lot in the industry, is I finance a lot of restaurants. It's probably about forty percent of the deals that I do. Um, okay. I love the industry. I grew up in the industry. I chase the industry. I love eating at the restaurants, etc. And I think I know the industry pretty well. So I see a lot of restaurant transactions. Um, a lot of the PPP allowed restaurants to survive. They A lot of them got PPP1, PPP2 stimulus. They got EIDL loans, which afforded them a lot of capacity. And so a lot of tours are buying second and third locations right now or building them with a lot of that stimulus if they weren't terribly affected by COVID. Some were, yeah. some were not, okay? And uh, conversely, what industries are you not interested, is your bank not interested in for whatever reason? Um, we don't shy away from in any industry. I mean, the obvious ones that are not eligible for SBA are anything cannabis related, anything they call empyrean. So you can't, I can't finance, you know, strip clubs and the, those type of business. What is it? Moral but turpitude? We, what is it? What is yeah, the term? Yeah, exactly. Empyrean. Yeah. <laughs> Moral. And, yes. That, that, that word. So, um, but no, we so, don't shy away from industries. We, we do gas stations, car washes, liquor stores, convenience, uh, again, restaurants. We finance a lot of restaurants. It really just has to make sense. That's all. Is a business ever too small for you guys' purchase price? Um, our loans range typically one hundred and fifty thousand to five million. I'll tell okay. you, most lenders don't want to do deals under two hundred and fifty thousand loan amount. Right. So if somebody came to me with a purchase price in the two hundred range and they were putting, say, fifty down, maybe a little less, maybe one eighty, putting down thirty thousand, we would do a loan of one fifty or better. It's those deals, you know, somebody comes in and says, I want to do a $100,000, uh, I have a $100,000 purchase price. Will you finance it? I will tell them immediately, if you're financing a small amount of money, figure out an alternative to SBA. SBA is a full doc process. It is very cumbersome. It is very lengthy. And it is the last place in general, it's how I make a living, it is the last place somebody wants to go for a, a loan that is small. It's not worth it to borrow a little amount of money. Get the mm. seller to financing. Get friends, family, and fools to finance. Home equity loan, uh, whatever. Don't use credit cards. Don't use silly financing mechanisms. But definitely opt for seller financing over an SBA loan for a small transaction. It's not worth your time. Well, well said. Last question. This is the last question before we sign off uh, on today's interview. And I didn't get to ask you 20 other questions I wanted to ask you, but um, closing costs, right? Since you've done so sure. many deals, this question comes up and I don't think I ever put it here. On average, when, when you're doing, say, a million dollar purchase, assuming there's a three times cash flow, cash flow in 350, uh, a year, you feel good, spreads nicely, good debt service coverage ratio. Um, what, what, what as a percentage of the transaction, what are you seeing as closing costs? I would say for the buyer, buyer. 
for the buyer. It's going to range between one and a half and three percent. I think a safe number is two to three percent. Mm-hmm. One of the things that a buyer needs to factor in, you know, banks don't charge a lot of fees. They're very small fees. Ours is a, a whole all all of fifteen hundred dollars, whether it's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan or a five million dollar loan. But you've got escrow fees. You've got an appraisal of the business in most cases. You, if you own a home, we're going to appraise the home. You've got title mm-hmm. fees associated with the recordation of the deed of trust on the home. Mm-hmm. Depending on how you allocate the purchase price, you might have ta- sales tax associated with the fixed assets, depending mm-hmm. on the business. If you've got rolling stock vehicles, for instance, a uh, heating and air conditioning plumbing company is going to have two to 10 uh, vehicles that are purchased or trailers, but titled Mm -hmm. motor vehicles, you've got sales tax fees, you've got DMV fees, and then you've got lease deposit. Everybody forgets about those ancillary costs, but they they add up. The SBA charges anywhere from zero to about 2.6% of the loan amount, depending on the size of the loan. So right now, May of 23, the um, SBA is charging zero for loans of 500000 or less. It's very small, up to a million, about 0.4%. And then over a million dollars, it gets to be pretty substantial at about 2.6% of the loan amount. So that's why the range of closing costs is going to be in the one and a half to three, 3% range. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, there's one last question. <laughs> Say... You get us a deal signed both ways, and you got a deal. We're about to open escrow. You have looked at the deal. Say you represent in the in this case, you pre-approved the deal on the sales side, so you know the deal, right? And you got a qualified buyer. What? How long is it taking nowadays from underwriting to closing on to removing the contingency on the loan on your case to getting a final um, approval? I'll I'll give you a couple of different time frames. Most transactions for most lenders, and I've done this 34 years, take 60 to 90 days. That's just a reality. Okay. Everybody says 60 to 90, that's a long time. Well, there's not seven days a week. There's only five for most people. Business owners, there's eight days a week. Lenders, escrow companies, appraisers, there's five days a week. There's a lot of holidays in there, etc. I've done deals in 11 days. I've done deals in 25 months. The reality is 60 to 90. More common is 60 for a transaction that does not have a liquor license and the involvement of ABC and the transfer of that license, much closer to 90 days for the liquor license transaction, restaurant, bar, et cetera. As far as removing contingencies, I would say no less than 30 days. 45 is ideal. We... We, we kind of have three phases. I, as a business development officer, pre-qualified transaction. I'm marrying the buyer's data with the seller's data. I'm sitting down with my credit manager. Despite my experience, I sit down on every deal. It's a five to 30 minute conversation. Who, what, where, when, and how. Are we going to do this deal? Yes. Here's how we're structuring it. Here's what it looks like. Here's what our needs are. I issue a pre-qualification letter. I send it to the buyer. They accept it, I hope. Um, We've gone far enough along where we all know what's going on. They send a good faith deposit in. I build that credit presentation, six to eight hour process. I submit it to underwriting. That underwriter takes three to 10 days to underwrite that transaction. They're juggling a couple of deals. They're juggling some other things. That's why it doesn't take four hours. It takes three to 10 days. They approve that loan. A commitment letter is issued. The borrower signs and accepts it. In a perfect world, I've done a good job to where my pre-qualification letter looks identical to the commitment letter, and we have not made any changes. We have not increased any requirements. We haven't decreased the loan. We haven't increased their down. We haven't changed the collateral. I haven't missed anything. That's the perfect world, and that's most common. Once that commitment letter is sent back to us, We move that loan to processing and processing then issues a very lengthy, and I will say that, uh, closing checklist. And that includes articles of organization, bylaws, business license, fictitious name statement, insurance, lease, who's the escrow and title company, et cetera. 
We order mm-hmm. business valuations. We order home appraisal if applicable. And that is now moved to that third phase of let's gather all the items necessary to draw closing docs, get them to escrow, sign and close this deal. So okay. this is wow. I, I got a lot more than I than, than I thank you. And can, can you guys really tell 34 years of experience? You don't have to think about the answers. They just come flowing out of you. So with this, we're going to wrap it up. Any final thoughts that you would want a buyer to know? You guys are going to be able to reach out to Bob directly. Any final thoughts? Um, I don't actually, I appreciate being on here. This has been fabulous. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, Bob, it was a, it was a thrill to have you on my show. Uh, you are a stand up guy, a classy guy and no wonder we work together. So I, it's no, it's no secret that I get to work with Bob Porter and on, uh, we got a deal going on right now. So, um, so that we're going to sign off for now, guys. We're going to say goodbye. I'm going to hang up now, uh, Bob, and then um, I'll be in touch. And, um, you know, we just, once they hang up, it, it, it's going to cancel. So this will be edited out. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Take buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For a limited time, I'm giving away my cash flow calculator. This nice little Excel workbook has helped thousands of people like yourself trying to figure out how much cash flow is left after you have a loan to buy a business. Cap rate and cash on cash returns. It is yours to keep. All you have to do is follow the links below and this is my gift to you, the cash flow calculator. Get it now.